Okay, great. So it's now 2 p.m. Central European time and time to kick off the second series of uh, Communications Numerical Linear Algebra. Welcome back to um, Common LA 2021. We're really excited and we have some um, nice things planned this season. And there's going to be a mix of research talks and some broader, um, more technical things. But today we're starting off with two research talks. Um, if you have any questions for either of our speakers on Zoom, please ask them in the Q&A, which will be moderated by Davide. Hi, Davide. Hi, everyone. Um, and if you have questions on YouTube, just put them in the chat and that will be monitored by Hassam. Hi, Hassam. Hi there. Great. I think that's all the housekeeping I have. Great. So our first talk um, is going to be from Christoph Strassner. Um, Christoph is a PhD student at EPFL, and he is going to be talking about functional tuck approximation using Chebyshev interpolation. So when you are ready, Christoph, take it away. Okay, so thank you for the kind introduction. And today I will be talking about my joint work with Sergei Dolgov and Daniel Kresner on functional tuck approximation using Chebyshev interpolation. So the topic of today will be functional low rank approximations which are some polynomial approximations of functions in combination with a low rank approximation of the coefficient tensors. And these types of approximations are already quite widely used. So one of the most famous application for this format are the, is the solution of time dependent partial differential equations, where you can use the functional low rank approximation to store your solution and then propagate it through time keeping the format such that you need much less storage than if you would have the full polynomial approximation. Some other applications are uncertainty quantification and sensitivity analysis, where you would use the approximation as surrogate for Monte Carlo sampling. Or you can also do other things, such as computing prices of, of options or some Helmholtz Hodge decompositions, as shown on the right. And Today, we will focus on a very special functional low rank approximation. We will only focus on the approximation of three variate functions, so functions and three variables on a hypercube. So we have some function from minus one, one to the three mapping to R. And we are looking on getting an approximation in a functional low rank format. And in particular, we are looking at the functional Tucker format. So what we will have is approximation format. We will have the sum of the product of some univariate functions u, v, and w. And the format of this whole approximation is a Tucker format. So we have some core tensor and we have a triple sum summing over each mode, which is a format that's already used in chep fun free. And how can we get such a format? We will do it via Chebyshev interpolation. So if we would do the tensorized interpolation of our free variate function, we would get an approximation where we have some coefficient tensor A and some Chebyshev polynomials in each mode, so T of X, T of Y, and T of Z. And this approximation would already fit into the format of the functional Tucker approximation that we had on the previous slide, but it's not really a low rank approximation since the degree of the Chebyshev polynomials is directly linked to the size of the coefficient tensor. And typically you can have a much smaller Core tensor in the approximation compared to the rank of the Chebyshev, the degree of the Chebyshev polynomials that you need for the approximation. So, how can we make this approximation cheaper? We will look at how we actually compute this coefficient tensor. And this is done by multiplying some evaluation matrix, which contains the evaluation of our function on a Chebyshev grid with some transformation matrices in each mode. So, to get this coefficient tensor, we need to have function evaluations equal to the size of the uh, coefficient tensor if we use this approach. And then what we want to do now is we want to use a low rank approximation instead of using the tensor of function evaluations. So we replace this tensor T by an approximation T hat and Tucker format. So we have some core tensor and some factor matrices U, V and W. And if we now plug this into the definition of our coefficient tensor, we will see that in our factor matrices, we have the transformation matrix times U. And the transformation matrix times U 
is equivalent to computing the univariate Chebyshev interpolation coefficients based on the values stored in each column of U. So we can write our overall decomposition as F hat, the function approximation as the core tensor times U bar of X, V bar of Y and W bar of Z. And in our work, we did some error analysis on this format. And this is not a new format. So this format has already been used to represent functions in JetFund3, as I said previously, which is part of the JetFund package for numerical computations with functions. And in that package, you can do many operations using the format, such as numerical integration and differentiation of the functions. So now we will look at how we can get the approximation into the format F hat. So given some arbitrary function, we now look first at a bivariate function so a function in two variables, we will sample it on a coarse grid. So this grid will be much coarser than the size of the coefficient tensor that we approximate. But what we do is we approximate this coarse grid using some adaptive cross approximation, which gives us an, 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 an approximation in terms of columns and rows of the matrix. And each column and row of this matrix can be related to a function fiber of the function. So if we have, for example, this column here, all the entries in this column are sampled at Chebyshev points of f of dot and with some fixed y coordinate. And what we can do now is once we have these columns or from this coarse grid, we can add additional Chebyshev points to the columns which are nested to refine these fibers, so the columns and the rows. And this directly gives us an approximation of a much bigger tensor for which we then compute the approximation of the coefficient tensor in our approximation. And we now want to transfer this idea to the case for three variate functions. And at first we look at what's done in JetFund3. So in JetFund3, they apply this adaptive cross approximation recursively. So they again sample the function as a, on a coarse tensor is a cost tensor on a coarse Chebyshev grid. And then they apply adaptive cross approximation to decompose this tensor where they merge the first two modes into one. So they get an approximation of fibers in the third mode and some slices of the tensor in the first two modes. And for each slice, they then apply recursively an additional adaptive cross approximation to get some columns and rows for each slice. So overall, this approximation contains three mode fibers, one mode fibers, and two mode fibers. And then they can refine all these fibers again and compress the approximation into the desired overall Tucker form. So this approach is not very, there's some slight issue with this approach. And this is that the slices might have very similar columns and rows when you select them. And this is, not optimal because our Tucker decomposition that we have in the end only looks at the span of all the columns that we use. And it turns out, for example, for the function shown here, that if I look at the first slice and collect all the columns that I select, I have a numerical rank of this ma the matrix of columns, which is equal to 17. And now if I add the second slice, I will have a numerical rank equal to 18. So one more than previously, but it will also have 17 fibers in there, which do not add, increase the numerical rank and are thus redundant. And now if I look at the third slice and the approximation that I would have for this function, it would even become worse because not the third to the 18th slide slice, they do not contribute any new fibers to our approximation. So all these fibers are redundant and we would actually not need them. So what we did, we were trying to design a novel algorithm where we avoid this redundancy. And we call this algorithm chapfun 3 f because we use fibers directly in the Tucker decomposition as factor matrices, which gives us the advantage that we will not have any redundancy. And on, as a basic principle, we will proceed similar to chapfun 3 so in our first phase, we will identify the fibers on a coarse grid, and then we will refine these fibers such that we have refined factor matrices, and then we will construct a core tensor given these refined factor matrices. 
So how can we proceed? We at first look at the coarse tensor of function samples, and we now only look at a sub tensor. So we restrict the second and the third mode with some index sets J and K. And then we have a sub tensor similar to the one shown here. And we take all the remaining columns of the sub tensor and put them into a matrix. And now we apply adaptive cross approximation to the matrix of the columns of the sub tensor, which then gives us some specific columns. And these columns will then put, be put into our approximation of the vector matrices. And it will give us some index set i based on the selected rows from the adaptive cross approximation. And these indices will then be used in the next step to restrict the first index set so that we have a selection of a sub tensor which contains some selected columns of the overall sample tensor. And we will repeat this procedure several times to update the index sets. And it turns out if we do this long enough, then fibers stored in U, V, and W will be good enough for an approximation. And this can be seen as some variant of the TT cross algorithm, just applied in a different format now. So after we have done these computations and obtained the vector matrices, we still somehow need to find the core tensor. So after the refinement, we have, will have vector matrices U, V, and W of our tensor T of function evaluations, which now might be significantly larger than the core sample tensor. So we try to avoid evaluating this tensor T completely. So now our task is to find the core tensor such that our Tucker approximation approximates the spec tensor. And we cannot use the standard approach of using orthogonal projections because that would require us to evaluate the tensor T completely. So what we do is instead we replace the orthogonal projections by oblique projections using discrete empirical interpolation. And this allows us to compute a core tensor approximation, which is still very good only using a R1 times R2 times R3 subtensor. If, so we only need to evaluate a ten, sub tensor of T equal to the size of the core tensor, which is much cheaper than if you would have to evaluate the full tensor. So how does this compare in practice to chap van free? So on these slides, you will see the number of function evaluations needed for the approximation for two different functions. So on the left, we have this exponential function. And on the right, we have this cosine hyperbolicus. And the number of function evaluations in all the both pictures is separated in the three phases. So phase one is the identification of the fibers. So for us, it's this variant of the TT cross algorithm. And for chap van free, it's the recursive application of the adaptive cross approximation. Then phase two is the refinement of the fibers. And phase three is the computation of the core tensor. And for the function on the left, we see that with our new approach, we have much fewer function evaluations when we are refining the fibers, which is due to the fact that we do not have any redundant fibers anymore in our approximation. On the right, there's a different example. And for this example, it turns out that the coarse tensor is already fine enough to approximate the fibers of the function sufficiently well. But still, our new approach is cheaper than the previous chap van free because we do not even need to evaluate the core sample tensor completely, but we're only ever working with a sub tensor of the core sample tensor. And this can go even further. So for the function shown here, it turns out that both in phase one and in phase two, our new chap van free f requires much fewer function evaluations compared to chap van free. And the number of function evaluations also leads to the same effect for the computational time to compute the approximation. And then one last example, which is more related to an application. So in uncertainty quantification, we quite often have a standard model of a parametric elliptic PDE with parameters P1, P2, P3. And we are now interested in how the solution of the PDE at the point one half one half behaves depending on the parameters. 
So we look at the function mapping from the parameters to the evaluation of the PDE solution and study how much time it takes JEPFAN and JEPFAN3 to compute the approximation of this mapping. And it again turns out that with our new JEPFAN3F approach, we are cheaper in terms of the number of functional evaluations compared to JEPFAN3. Okay. So the main takeaway message of the talk is that we will have similar accuracy in our approximations, no matter which approach we use. So the new approach that we suggest or the recursive adaptive cross approximation. But with our new approach, we can get the same accuracy of the approximation with fewer function evaluations. And these results can be found in the paper functional attacker approximation using Chebyshev interpolation, which is available on archive. And you can also get the code on GitHub if you want to experiment with JEPFAN3F yourself. Great, thank you for that, Christoph. Um, do we have any questions on Zoom? No, there's no question at the moment, no. Sorry. Um, there's a question actually from Benham Ashemi. Very nice work indeed. Are there any classes of functions for which chepfan 3 needs a smaller number of function evaluations compared with chepfan 3 f So the one thing that can happen where chepfan 3 might be better than chepfan 3 f is if the function is very locally supported, because in this case it might not be possible to find the support of the function if we only sample a sub-tensor of the core sampling tensor. But if the function has a support that's over, contain, like, consistent over the whole domain, it's usually possible that Jefferson 3 f is better. But you will always be able to find functions where the sub-tensor selection will fail. OK, thank you. Um... There's no other questions so far on Zoom. I think there's a comment from Nick Trefethen saying that he wanted to say this was a very interesting talk and thanks. Um, do we have any questions on YouTube? Uh, no, we don't. Great. Well, thanks again for that, Christoph. I'll just stop recording. Yeah, maybe you can unshare your screen. Great, so our second talk of today is going to come from Joao Paxal. Um, Joao it, did his PhD at Pontifica Universidade Católica de Rio de Janeiro in 2014 and is now an assistant professor at the Universidade Federal de Rio de Janeiro. Um, and he's going to be telling us about algorithms in graphical linear algebra. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that, that looks uh, great. Thanks for everybody, for, for the organizers for putting this together. This is this is, seems like a great event. Um, today I'm gonna be talking about graphical linear algebra, and this is a uh, joint work with uh, with Pavel Sabazinski and Lucas Rufino, one from Tallinn University, one from my university uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go right to it. Um, one of my main motivations, I don't, I don't know if this is a true numerical linear algebra talk, but my main motivation, I was, I was, I've been teaching linear algebra at UFRJ for uh, uh, seven years now. And I saw an increase of numbers from areas outside of math, computer science, engineering, taking linear algebra. And I saw they had a lot of difficulty proving things. They, they just had a tough time with the large number of concepts in linear algebra. And uh, I just wanted to find new ways to teach linear algebra. And I came across this graphical linear algebra, which is a both diagrammatic and formal language developed independently by two different groups. And uh, I, I got into contact with uh, one of the authors and I kind of been working on this in the last year or two uh, with them. And one of, the, one of the really nice things about uh, this graphical linear algebra is just this very small set of axioms for linear algebra. And we were able to develop, like, uh, to, to get these axioms, and which they highlight the dualities and symmetry of linear algebra. So I'm going to try to show you a little bit about it. So the main idea with the graphical language is the diagrams that we're going to write. We're going to try to do linear algebra graphically. 
and the diagrams are gonna represent processes. So we're gonna have uh, inputs coming on the left, outputs on the right, and uh, on these, and we're gonna have these processes uh, like this one here, making a, a, a dessert. You can break it up into into uh, different pieces, and uh, and you can put it together. All right. So the first process we need to do linear algebra is uh, sum, right? So we're gonna sum is a uh, it has two wires coming in, they're the two inputs, it sums things together and outputs the sum, right? So 43, you, you can interpret it as the 43 comes in, the 57 comes in, and then the 100 comes out, okay? So sum is one of our generators we're gonna call in this language, okay? And uh, other generators that we have is the identity generator, something comes in, the same thing comes out, and also the twist. Something that comes in on the top, goes out on the bottom, it goes in on the bottom, comes up on top, okay? This has two, two entries, two inputs, two outputs. This is one input, one output, okay? And you can start putting diagrams, more complex diagrams together. For example, you can do like serial composition of the diagrams, the twist and the sum. If you can, uh, if, if this has two outputs and this has two inputs, you can, ser you can do the serial composition of them and you come up with a new diagram. Okay, simple enough. So you got serial composition and you also got parallel composition. For example, we can put the identity and, and, and the sum in parallel and then you get this new diagram here. Or you can put the sum in parallel with the identity and uh, you get this diagram down here. Okay, so the in, in parallel composition, the order actually matters, okay? So these are the two, these are the two main uh, operations we can uh, to do to build new, new diagrams, okay? And you can make these like very large diagrams, but just by combining in parallel, like here, um, like you put all these processes in parallel, all, all these processes in parallel, and then you combine them in composition. So you can make uh, complex things, okay? So now we're gonna start developing the rules. Like we, we know how to build the diagrams in this language. And now we're gonna build, uh, come up with some rules. One of the main rule, one of, one of the rules is that you can untangle uh, wires, okay? If you have, uh, uh, the, the wires never get tangled up. You can just, you can pull them apart like topologically, okay? Um, and you, and you it, never, never, it never gets crazy. Okay, the other thing that we can do is the, the generators that can slide across the wires. Okay, no problem sliding the diagram, the, the generators across the, the slides. Okay, and you can also slide them down like this, right? So if you have a sum here, you can bring it down there, you can bring it back up. Okay, the generators can slide, that's one, another rule for us. Okay, now we're gonna start doing some rules for the generators itself, like sum. Okay, sum, for example, is commutative. And uh, so the uh, x plus y, we know it doesn't matter the order. This is how we're gonna represent graphically, okay? So we, we introduce this equation into our diagrams, okay? Also, for example, sum is associative. You can sum x plus y and then you uh, add it to z, or you can uh, add y and z first and then add it, add it to x. So the, this is also an equation in our system, okay? And we, we introduce another generator, which is this, the zero generator. It just outputs zero, okay? You, you can imagine just a zero coming out of, of this generator here. And for example, when you do sum plus the zero generator, you get the identity, okay? So the, the zero generator is, is the unit of the sum here. Okay, so another equation that we put in up. Okay, and uh, uh, and and then after you after you build up your equations, then you can start doing proofs. Okay, so just a quick example here. This equation here, we don't have it in our system. We have this one where the zero is on top, but we don't have uh, this equation here where the zero is on the bottom. Okay, what you can do the proof. Uh, is that you can start replacing pieces of diagrams with, a, with, with uh, diagrams that are equivalent. For example, you go from here to this one, you're just using the commutative. Then you can slide the, the zero on uh, to the top and you get this equation. 
And then you can use the, the, the unit rule to get back to the identity. So this would be a, a graphical proof where you're just moving things around and applying uh, your axioms that we developed so far. So this equation here, we were, ab we were able to prove we were, we were, by using the, the axioms that we, we, we established before, okay? So far, so good. And uh, what's really interesting about the graphical language is when, when you get to the other generator, right? We have the generator sum that we, everyone's seen before, uh, but this generator is one that's not used to not, not used to being seen in mathematics. The copy generator, right? We don't usually have a symbol for that, but it's like you can pretend this is a copy machine, where an X comes in and just gets copy um, on top and on the bar and this the same thing. Okay, so this is the copy machine, and you also have the discard. Anything that comes in here gets discarded by by this this black dot. Okay, so these, I'm gonna introduce these two generators. And what's interesting about it is the copy generator uh, also has a commutative property, also has an associative property, and also uh, the copy and the discard also ha have this unity property, okay? So the axioms for copying are, ex uh, are very similar to the ones for sum. Okay, if you, if you look at, at this slide for a little bit, you can see that it's actually just the mirror image and uh, switching the white to the black. So you flip them around and you switch colors and, and you get the axioms for the copy, okay? So these are our axioms, adding and copying, that's what we're gonna use. And, um, and uh, what is good about establishing the axioms like this is that you get like some theorems, you kind of get it for free, okay? Uh, so think about, uh, if you think about it, like if you have this equation here and you wanna prove it, you, you say to yourself, oh, okay, I already proved this equation for the sum. So what I can do is just flip things around and switch colors and I'm using kind of the same proof, okay? Uh, I, can just, I can just copy the same proof by switching things around and switching colors, okay? So when you get one theorem, uh, you get another one for free, okay? And you can do that throughout all linear algebra. I'm doing this in the first couple of steps. In the, in, in, in the graphical language, um, you can also, you can also uh, represent uh, natural numbers. Uh, for example, you have the zero number here, one. When you wanna make a, when you wanna represent two or three, for example, you, you make a copy of X, you make a copy again, and then you get three copies of X, and then you sum, and then you sum, okay? Now you have a, 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 a way to multiply um, anything that, any input by three or by any natural number, okay? So you can, you can model all the natural numbers just using the copy and the sum, which, which is nice, okay? And then what's really interesting is that you can, uh, you can, uh, you can get the, you can get, for example, two by two matrices of natural numbers. You can establish that by, by uh, two by two diagrams. For example, you have this X1 here. You have this X1 here, X2. The X1 gets copy here. The X1 gets copy. The X2 gets here and the X2 goes here. Okay. And then when you, when you pass it over, this gets multiplied by three X1 by doing the natural number construction we did before. And then the four X2, and then you sum up and you get this. Same thing here, you get the two X2, and then you get it here, okay? So you're able, we're also able to draw um, uh, two by two matrices or N by N matrices just by using the, the copy and the sum generators, okay? So, that's that's what we have so far is that we have matrices okay but but the language starts getting very confusing really quickly because there's so many wires and you to to be able to draw like bigger matrices uh you need to start abstracting the language okay so whenever you have like too many wires uh you, we're going to define this as just writing the number k on top and this is going to be a wire that you know it's already k copies of the identity or you can do the same thing for copying when you want to copy three different things. And you start abstracting away 
And uh, now you can you can think about a matrix as um, something that, makes, that has n wires here, and then m wires here, and then uh, we, we can start drawing matrices a little bit more compactly. Okay. All right. So we have matrices and in, uh, in, uh, in the graphical language. One more time. Okay. Uh, so one question is is what are the axioms? that you need to, to add uh, besides the ones we introduced to deal with, uh, we started dealing with uh, matrices and, and, and have a language for, to, to, to play around with matrices, okay? And uh, one thing you can do, one thing you can, oh, sorry. One thing you can do is, one second, let me erase this. So one thing you can do is you introduce more axioms, the, the way how the, uh, uh, to, to get matrices. And one of the things we did was introduce these four axioms that how, how did the diagrams that we have, how do they interact with, uh, with uh, zeros? How do they interact with sums? How do they interact with discard? And how do they interact with copy, okay? So for example, uh, a matrix is here that you throw a lot of zeros into the matrix. Okay, I'm representing this as a full matrix. Then, it, it, if you have a, a, a matrix D and another matrix D, and then you sum them, you know we can sum things first and then multiply by D. Okay, so these are the linearity axioms written graphically. Okay, so. Uh, anything times zero, any matrix times zero gets the zero vector and linearity uh, axiom is here, okay? But you also get the same axioms for, for the discard and the copy, okay? You, we added this exact same axioms for the, for the copy as well, okay? So if you, if you have a vector coming in, multiply by matrix and gets discarded, then it's, you can just discard. If you have a matrix and then being copy, you can copy the matrix here and here and then multiply. Okay, uh, this should be this should be okay. Okay, so we added these these four these four axioms here. Okay, and uh, and then you can you can prove that every diagram that I built here with these rules they're actually equivalent to matrices of natural number. For every diagram, there's a matrix of natural numbers and for every matrix of natural numbers, then you, can do a, uh, then you can do a diagram for that, okay? And the, the proof of this theorem, I'm not gonna go through here, but it's essentially how to do matrix multiplication, matrix multiplication graphically, okay? So uh, you can get this, this, this connection. But like, so you're able to get this language for, for matrices, but to do linear algebra, you need way more than matrices. You need, uh, you can't just do linear functions. You need equations, you need subspaces, you need linear relations in general, okay? So the idea is, for example, if you, if you have a matrix here and, uh, and you wanna ex express it, AX equals zero, for example, like the, the kernel of a matrix A, uh, or something like AX equals BY. So how can you do that in the graphical language? The main idea here is uh, to now you can, uh, you can turn the generators around and you can make the zero generator be not actually, actually a restriction here where you can think about, um, you can think about there's an X coming in here. It's gonna go through the matrix, it's gonna be AX, Okay, and then it has to be equal to zero because uh, we have this ge zero generator here, but turned around. So this this uh, diagram here uh, is representing the kernel of a matrix. Okay, uh, and then uh, and then uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can start representing subspaces this way. Okay, or for example, if you have a, a vector x, a vector y. Uh, this will represent AX uh, equals BY, okay? Because you have AX here, 
you have by here and then they have to meet in the middle and that's what they're representing so you start you're able to once you turn things around uh you can represent uh uh things from uh, from a, a course in linear algebra that has more than matrices okay so what do you actually have to do graphically is that you have your generators the four generators that we introduce you have to switch them you have to turn them around and introducing uh these now these these eight uh generators okay so you have uh this you can think of as a, as a, gen, a zero generator this you can think as a as a zero description uh, con, uh constraint i mean um okay so what are the axioms for the re linear relations now we're, we're just talking more than than linear functions but linear relations and the axioms are exactly the same we had before, but switched around, uh, okay? Just a uh, uh, mirror version of them. So you have these, these, uh, these 12 axioms here for the copy, the, the, for copy sum and, and, their, and their opposite versions, okay? And, and you also need to know how the diagrams interact with the generators like we did before, and uh, we were able to, I, I won't have time to go through this, but we were able to establish uh, the, exactly the, the axioms that you need to, 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 to actually get the whole linear algebra in your graphical language. So they're, they're, these are the axioms that you need to include. Um, and you need to also start including uh, um, a new symbol which which gives you like inclusion of the subspaces like a subspace is included in another subspace but i, I won't go through this here um this is this is we were able to establish these axioms and we were able to to prove that every diagram the linear relation on rationals and every linear relation on the rationals is also a diagram okay this is this result was already established by Bach, Sobozinski, Zanazi, and Erbel and Baz, they, are, they had a group of axioms that they proved that was equivalent to, to linear algebra, but we were able to, to, to get uh, this smaller group of axioms which were, where they have this duality is more explicit in them and, and also start using the, the inequalities, okay? So, um, and what's nice about it is this duality here. You you start getting something more powerful than buy one get get one for free. Is since you have this this uh, you have this duality of the mirror version and the duality of the color uh, inversion. You get you 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 prove one theorem and you get uh, three theorems for free. Okay. For example, this is the characterization of uh, uh, a relation being surjective. And then you get for free the, the characterization of relation being uh, total or the characterization of uh, a relation being single value or being injective, for example. So these all are like classical theorems in linear algebra, and then you can prove them just by proving one of them. So you get this, this idea. Um, okay, uh, let me see. Just, just so you get an idea how to prove things like uh, something more algorithmic, like for, uh, for, for example, like a proof of a theorem, like uh, the kernel of A uh, can be represented as an image, okay? So the image you can, you can draw something like this. So this is, this is a kernel, uh, this is an image, and then you wanna prove that every kernel can be written as an image, something that you do in a basic course in linear algebra. And the proof is you can do that all graphically and uh, where I would have to go through the steps uh, in detail, but it's essentially you, 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 you break up the matrix in two pieces and you do, you do an induction and then, you, and then you kind of play things around and you can get down to, to an image, okay? But the, the, the fun thing about proving things in the graphical language is that we came up, what, what we've been trying to do is that after you do the proof of a, of a theorem like this, you get, a, you get a, for free uh, uh, an algorithm, okay? The algorithm is, 
to 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 turn a, to get a kernel into an image is exactly coming from like the the graphical proof right so here we break up the matrix into two here in the code we break it up the matrix into two so you can kind of you get a, you get the the algorithm kind of for free here too so that's that's something we're excited about I, I think i'm i'm running out of time but like for example if you if you had this this dual uh, this dual algorithm where an image becomes a kernel you can just switch the colors you do the same proof and then you get like a, an algorithm for free how to go from a kernel to an image okay um this is just the, you, you usually get like recursive algorithms which use a lot of uh, block linear algebra for example okay i think i'm running out of time so i won't show you this slide but what's what's going on under the hood this is all inspired by category theory and uh, kind of like the functional programming of mathematicians. Um, and uh, what one of the things we wanted to do is kind of get this uh, undergraduate graphical linear algebra textbook out to, to see if people can use this to help in their, in their classes um, in, 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 a, in an undergraduate class, okay? Uh, a question people, a lot of people ask is like, can you prove new, can you come up with new theorems from linear algebra using this language? We haven't yet, but we're trying to, and um, it kind of has connections to the, 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 the talk from yesterday, from, uh, from 20 minutes ago. Uh, we're trying to come up with these like low, low rank approximation theorems, uh, which can, could generalize uh, 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 some theorems in, in linear algebra. And uh, we also are looking for help for that if someone is interested. In. Um, what I recommend if, you, if you're interested in this talk is uh, this graphical linear algebra.net is a blog by my, my, my collaborator, Pavel. It's very accessible. And uh, also check out our paper, the calcula calculational proofs in relational graphical linear algebra uh, that has more information on that. So thanks a lot for for, for being here and organizing this. Amazing, thank you for that, Joao. Um, do we have any questions on Zoom, Davide? Uh, we do. So we have a couple of questions by Cliff Moller. The first is um, linear independence, Frank. So I believe that he asked, uh, how do you uh, represent these concepts in your language? So linear independence and rank. How to, how to represent that? You need to, oh, sorry, one second. Let me open here. Can you, you, you guys can still see my screen? I think uh, you unshared. Sorry? I think you'll have to share again. Oh, sorry. That's right. Um, maybe just here on the whiteboard. You can see the whiteboard? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what do you what do you need to do is you need to to come up with for example let me, let me get a black you can come up with for example um, what you need to come up with we have that already is that every matrix can be broken up in a u and l for example and a, a permutation matrix so like the LU decomposition, uh, you can you can represent it by by having the rank be the number of wires uh, here uh, in this this decomposition, for example. So if you have this decomposition, you can start representing rank with it. So it's um, it's kind of the same way we do in linear algebra. So if you have this. This matrix being injective, this matrix being subjective, and 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 you get you get this is the this is the the rank the composition, and then you get the rank. I don't know if that too quick to to answer, but okay. And the second we, question, yeah, we, we can we can we can do that. And and sorry, oh, he asked about linear independence. So, for example, if you have a, a kernel of a matrix. If the kernel equals zero, then this means that the A is injective. 
So this is how you represent, like the columns of A are linear independence, and then this is how you represent it. But there's also all these different characterizations to say that A is injective. For example, you can write something like this. Or you have all these different ways to say that uh, the columns of A are linear independent. Okay, and the second question he asked is um, implement in Simulink. So do you have any sort of implementation? Uh, could you implement in Simulink by using Simulink or something? That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, we're, we're actually implementing in Julia, but uh, the, the dream actually is to be able to go from the graphical language uh, straight translation into code. And that, that's, that uh, I'm not working on, but I know some groups are working on that. Just to have you to be able to write the proof graphically and it already uh, translates into code for you, but uh, I'm not working on that. Thank you. Great. Um, Hassam, do we have any questions on YouTube? No, there aren't. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for that. And thanks to both of us because that was a really good start to um, the 2021 session. Um, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move over to Gather um, shortly. But before we do, just a quick announcement from me. Um, if I can share my screen, there we go. Okay, so hopefully you've all realized that the frequency of the sessions has changed. It's going to be every two weeks now rather than every week. Um, so our next talk will be on the 1st of March, and we're going to have a team effort from Julian Hall and Yvette Galabova, both from the University of Edinburgh, who will be talking um, about some software they've designed and also how it works in collaboration with um, industry partners. So that's going to be a more like, technically focused talk rather than a research talk. We still have slots open for the rest of 2021, so if you or anyone you know is interested, please apply via the website. Remember, we're looking for research talks and also things that are kind of a bit more um, general in terms of um, coding or collaboration or working with partners. So if you think you've got something interesting to say, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I think that's everything I had to say and see you all and gather in a second.